From giant offshore oil rigs to massive tunnel digging drills, here are eight of the biggest machines in the world. Boeing 747 One of the most recognizable jetliners in the world, the Boeing 747 made its first flight in February of 1969. Quickly becoming a favorite of passengers, it was also used as the airliner for Air Force One as well as being the setting for a number of Hollywood adventure movies. With only 170 of the passenger versions of the Boeing 747 in fleets around the world, many airlines have begun to replace the passenger 747s with larger, more advanced twin-engine planes. The first twin-engine wide-body passenger plane, the 747, was developed with the cabin split into rooms with galleys and lavatories installed as dividers between them. Built for long-haul travel, the plane weighed over 750,000 pounds kilograms, and had a main deck of 20 feet wide six meters. Its size meant that the cockpit had to be located above the main deck, giving it a distinctive hump behind the flight deck. Commonly called a jumbo jet, a typical 747 accommodates 416 passengers using a two-deck configuration to fit them in. Flying at high subsonic speeds of 913 kilometers an hour, or 567 miles per hour, they can fly non-stop from New York to Hong Kong, a third of the way around the globe. With five different variants of the 747, numerous versions of each type have been produced since the late 1960s. Popular for both domestic airlines and transoceanic flights, early models had more than 700 pounds kilograms of depleted uranium molded to the engines. Because they are so long, the fuselage has a small flexure in flight. Certified to fly on three of its four engines, they can successfully take off even if an engine fails. Chances are you have flown on a 747 at some time in your life, but if not, you've probably seen a number of popular films including Goldfinger, Snakes on a Plane, and Air Force One. The first crash of the 747 occurred in 1974, but since then very few crashes have been attributed to design flaws of the plane. With a number of governments using them as a VIP transport and their popularity in commercial travel, it's easy to see why the 747 continues to have such a stellar reputation. Prelude Ship the Prelude is a floating liquefied natural gas facility off the coast of Australia that produces natural gas for cargo customers in Asia. Stretching almost one-third of a mile .8 kilometers, along with the deck longer than four soccer fields, the Prelude displaces as much water as five aircraft carriers. Owned by Shell, the structure began construction in 2012 and was finished in July of 2017 in South Korea before being towed to Australia. Located 125 miles 200 kilometers north of the Western Australian coast, it is taller than the Eiffel Tower and almost as tall as Willis Tower in Chicago. In 2018, it began pumping gas from the seabed to the floating platform where it was cooled before being loaded into tanks of liquefied gas. Even though it looks like a ship, the vessel is not a boat and needs to be towed to its destination. It can produce enough gas to fuel large carriers at remote locations. The ship is estimated to remain in the prelude field for 25 years before being towed to another offshore field. Able to harvest at least 520 million tons of liquids per year, the Prelude is as wide as the wingspan of a Boeing 747. It requires more than 6,700 horsepower thrusters to position the facility and it uses 13 million gallons 50 million L, of water every hour to cool it. Understandably, it costs a lot to build the vessel, with some estimates coming in between $10.8 billion and $12.6 billion. Space Shuttle with big dreams come big ships, so it's no surprise that NASA's Space Shuttle, the world's first reusable spacecraft, is one of the largest machines that currently exists. The very first Space Shuttle mission was launched in April 1981 aboard the orbiter Columbia. The last was Atlantis, which flew in July 2011, but the Space Shuttle program also suffered two major disasters, including the Challenger in 1986 and the Columbia in 2003, upon which 14 astronauts died while flying the two missions. Known for launching and servicing the Hubble Space Telescope, one of the Space Shuttle's largest contributions was building the International Space Station. The shuttle is made up of three main components, including two solid rocket boosters, the rust-colored external tank that feeds fuel to the main engines during launch, and the orbiter, which contains the crew cabin, main engines, and payload bay. 
After the solid rocket boosters provide thrust to get the shuttle into orbit for the first two minutes of flight, the boosters separate, allowing the orbiter to carry the ship 70 miles around the Earth. The orbiter is the part that most people think of as the shuttle, and is about 122 feet long, 38 meters, with a wingspan of 78 feet, 24 meters, about the same size as a DC-9 aircraft. Between 1994 and 1998, the shuttle flew 11 times to the Russian space station, Mir. But its most famous task was bringing up astronauts, pieces, and equipment to build the International Space Station, taking 13 years and dozens of shuttle missions to complete. With five space shuttles built during the entire shuttle program, the Columbia was the first to fly in space. Although the Challenger was originally built to test its construction, it was later upgraded for spaceflight. Endeavour was made out of spare parts from other shuttles to replace the Challenger after the shuttle exploded in 1986. Despite its two disasters and the death of several crew members, the space shuttle program performed thousands of hours of basic science experiments, important work needed to advance life back down here on Earth. Would you ever get on board the space shuttle? It seems dangerous to me, but there's nothing more exciting for a person than to push the final frontier of outer space. Let me know what you think and if you'd go on this rocket in the comments below. And while you're doing that, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. There are tons of amazing videos coming out as fast as you can watch them. You won't want to miss even one. Hydraulic Forging Press during the 1930s and 1940s when Germany was building their arsenal for war, they ran out of steel, but with their mines producing large quantities of magnesium, German scientists came up with a way to build their armament. Steel is one of the building blocks of the industrial age, but it's not the only metal that can be used to develop powerful weapons, building materials, and even airplanes. As jet planes were produced and the search for lighter and faster materials to build these planes grew, the hydraulic press was born. Created to forge magnesium and aluminum components, German engineers in the 1940s built 3,300-ton hydraulic press so that they could build the first ME-262 jet fighters. When the United States got wind of the Germans' technology, the US launched the heavy press program so that they could build the world's largest forging presses themselves. Started in 1950 and completed in 1957, the two largest presses could apply about 50,000 tons of force each and are both still in operation today. The first weighed 8,000 tons and stretched 80 feet, 27 meters high. Built in 1957, a Ukrainian company who specialized in steelworks equipment built two 75,000-ton presses to outwit the Americans. Not wanting to sit on the sidelines, in 2013, the Chinese created a similar machine with the power of 80,000 tons. Stretching as tall as a 10-story building, the machine is believed to be used to build parts for military aircraft. It is so powerful that it could easily lift an entire cruise ship. Although it is not necessarily the most technologically advanced press in the world, Using the old USSR projects in the 1980s, it was the most powerful. Used in aircraft and aerospace development, these massive machines are definitely impressive, if not intimidating, knowing that they are mostly used to create aircraft and other weapons of war. Large Hadron Collider Near Geneva, Switzerland, the most powerful particle accelerator ever built sits in a tunnel 320 feet 100 meters underground. A machine that pushes protons or ions to near the speed of light, the Large Hadron Collider accelerates beams of particles to such incredible speeds that they move almost at the speed of light itself. First built in 2008, the Large Hadron Collider has a 16-mile ring of superconducting magnets and a number of accelerating structures that boost the energy of the particles within it. Inside the accelerator, particle beams travel close to the speed of light before they collide and create miniature supernova explosions. But what exactly is the Large Hadron Collider used for? A part of a project run by the European Organization for Nuclear Research, it causes beams to collide with one another, allowing scientists to record the resulting events and enabling them to learn how the universe began and what it's made of. Built to increase our knowledge of the universe, scientists study the results in the hopes of using their discoveries for practical applications. But with such a large machine, there are still so many unknown variables. Many of the scientists that work on the project admit they aren't sure what happens when it starts to work. Because there's never been a particle accelerator as powerful as this one, scientists can only provide educated guesses on the results they will receive from it. There was even speculation before it was put into use that this machine might generate a miniature black hole that would immediately destroy Earth itself. Dredges 
While dredges were used by old timers when excavating gold in Alaska, a much larger dredger known as the Cristobal Colon ship tips the scales. A one of a kind dredging ship, it measures 750 feet, 223 meters lengthwise, and 1,230 feet, 41 meters breadthwise. In the ocean, dredges are used to remove deposits that sit deep underwater, and with ocean floors at such great depths, it would take nothing less than a super dredge to get there. The Cristobal Colon is just one in a fleet of dredges owned by a Belgian conglomerate. Raised at the top of the class in dredging ships, it has a hopper capacity of 495,000 square feet, 46,000 square meters, 40% more than its closest peer. The hopper is the outdoor hold where the material is stored before it is processed. The largest dredge in the world with the most high-tech system on board, the Cristobal Colon can travel at up to 18 knots when fully loaded and is able to remove sand, gravel, sludge, and clay through special suction pipers that are lowered to the seabed. After dragging the head over the bottom, a pump system brings up the soil and water and discharges it into the hopper. The ship then sets sail to its unloading site where the material is either deposited back on the ocean floor in this new destination or pumped ashore through a pipeline to reclaim land. Built in 2009, the Christabel Colon has a twin ship known as the Leave Ericsson, but the Christabel Colon still holds the record for being the true original. Big Bertha when the Washington State Department of Transportation needed to build a new tunnel after the collapse of the Alaskan Way viaduct, they needed a method that would not displace or destroy the city's skyscrapers and historical buildings above ground. To accomplish that, they commissioned a Japanese firm to build a 57.5 foot diameter, 17 meters, 326 foot long, 100 meters worm dubbed Big Bertha to dig the tunnel. The tunnel boring machine works much like an earthworm by eating, moving forward, and spewing out the waste behind itself. With a drill head composed of 260 moving cutters, Big Bertha can eat through 35 meters of ground, 11 meters with no problem. With its 25,000 horsepower engine, it has special nozzles designed to turn the earth it eats into a paste for easier removal. At the back of the machine, the chunks of stone and dirt are moved onto a conveyor belt and unloaded onto a barge moored in a nearby bay. As the machine moves through the tunnel, the conveyor belt grows, allowing it to continue to move the dirt along the deeper the boring machine gets. Even more remarkable is the fact that the machine could install concrete panels, build walls, and leave an almost completely finished product behind in its wake. The project was supposed to take two and a half years to complete, but unfortunately after the tunnel had been bored about 10%, temperatures underground spiked and alarm bells began to rise. It took one month for the Washington State Department of Transportation to find the culprit. The blades of the machine ended up encountering a long steel pipe left over from a previous project. Because the machine cannot cut through steel, several of the cutting blades were damaged and had to be replaced before the project continued. Completed in February of 2019, the tunnel was reopened to traffic, allowing vehicles to travel through a modern marvel of engineering created by one of the world's largest machines. Komatsu D575A Bulldozer Big jobs require big machines, so it's no surprise that the largest production bulldozer in the world is used in massive open mines to move material. Able to push 3,375 cubic feet 95 meters cubed, of dirt, the Komatsu D575A3 Super Dozer weighs 336,000 pounds 150,000 kilograms, and has 1,100 horsepower. Because it is so big, the dozer must be disassembled and moved into 6 to 8 tractor trailer loads. Considered the largest operational crawler tractor in the world, the D575 averages 16 feet high, 5 meters, and with a standard blade attached, measures 224 feet wide, 7 meters, and almost 40 feet long, 12 and a half meters, over three times the dimension for an average car. The amount of material the Komatsu can move would take the average person approximately 720 wheelbarrow loads to move by hand, but the creators did not stop there. In 1996, a super dozer model was added to the line of supersized crawler tractors and put into production into operation at a West Virginia coal mine where they previously moved about 1,125 feet, 350 meters an hour. With the new dozer, they were able to move a whopping 2,250 feet, 700 meters an hour. With further updated models, including a bulldozer-ripper combination and a dedicated bulldozer, Komatsu continues to lead the way with the world's largest capacity dump trucks. Which one of these massive machines excited you the most? Do you think humanity will keep making bigger and bigger machines? Tell me your opinion in the comments below, and thank you for watching. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already, and see you next time.
Which of these massive machines would you most like to control for one day and why? 